Bé, bon, bon dia a tothom, gràcies per venir. Uh, és un plaer per mi presentar el, el professor Jan Golinski. Continuaré en anglès d'aquí uns moments, però volia dir unes paraules en català, ja que estem a l'Institut d'Estudis Catalans. I agrair també a la Societat Catalana d'Història de la Ciència i la Tècnica, que en col·laboració amb el Centre d'Història de la Ciència de l'Autònoma organitza de, amb una certa freqüència seminaris conjunts i aquest és un dels, dels casos. Uh, I was speaking Catalan, but I will, I will continue in English just to help you to follow. Well, just to introduce Jan Golinski, it's a great pleasure to have him here. He was just traveling to Europe and he uh, kindly offered a paper to us to come to Barcelona. He, was, he, he had never been in our city and he thought it was a great opportunity to visit the city, but also to visit our group and our community of historians of science. That means we are extremely grateful for his generosity to offer a paper, a paper and a very fresh uh, book that will appear very soon in Chicago University Press and Humphrey Davy. And for those who don't know much about uh, his academic career, uh, Professor Jan Kolinsky studied natural sciences in Cambridge and did his PhD in history and philosophy of science in the University of Leeds under the supervision of John Christie, historian of chemistry. And then he moved to the stage where he got, uh, after some years, a position of, as professor uh, in history and humanities in a history department, which is not very often, not very common in continental Europe to have uh, chairs of history of science in history departments in the University of New Hampshire. He has been working a lot on history of chemistry, history of science in general, especially in the Enlightenment. He has also huge interest in historiography. Some of probably the most known books are uh, Making Natural Knowledge, a book that causes, I think, a great impact in our community. Probably you remember some readings of this book. Uh, in our graduate program in the 90s, in the early 2000, uh, Constructivism and the History of Science. It was published in 98, but we'll, there, has a, there, there is a second edition of the book in 2005. Then, Science as Public Culture, Chemistry and Enlightenment in Britain in 1760, 1820, was a book that in the 90s, I think, was a very important book in order to revisit the way in which traditionally the chemical revolution of the late uh, 18th century has been approached, and a book that uh, brought to the fore the problem of audience, uh, the, the feedback that audience, public culture, uh, sites, public sites, and specific places play an important role in the making of chemical knowledge and knowledge in general in the Enlightenment. He also has published an, uh, a book on the British weather and the, the climate of the Enlightenment, uh, an edited book with Simon Schaffer uh, and William Clark on the sciences in the Enlightenment in Europe, which was a book that appeared in 1999. It was a very important revision of the way in which historians of science had approached the Enlightenment until that period. And he has also very interesting and useful historiographical papers, a part of the Making Natural Knowledge. Uh, a recent paper of him has appeared uh, in History of Science 2011, Science in the Enlightenment Revisited, another paper on a recent issue of Osiris in 2012. That means he's, I think, very active in this historiographical reflection, which very often is a sort of amateur task that as we as historians undertake, but it's a very important task and very rewarding for all of us. No? Then, thank you, Jean, for being here. It's a great pleasure, and we are really looking forward to listen to your uh, fresh uh, story and this uh, sort of uh, self-experimenter that uh, Humphrey Davy is supposed to be yeah. in the early 19th century. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Uh, well, I'm very pleased to be here. Thank you, indeed, for welcoming me to this beautiful uh, setting. Um, uh, uh, I. Uh, Augusti didn't say that uh, earlier this week I thought I might not get here at all <laughs> due to the Lufthansa pilot strike. And I've now learned that Lufthansa has now canceled my flight back to Boston, so I may be here 
longer than I expect. So if there's one thing, one thing to learn from this lecture, do not trust Lufthansa. <laughs> uh, so uh, the presentation I'm going to give is um, uh, a sort of outline of the book that uh, Augustine mentioned that's coming out from the University of Chicago Press um, uh, probably next year. Uh, and it's um, a study of uh, Humphrey Davy which um, responds partly to issues um, specific to the period of the late 18th, early 19th centuries, um, and partly to more general questions um, surrounding the formation of the identity of the practitioner of the sciences. Um, these are issues that used to be treated within the narrative framework of professionalization, uh, but that narrative framework has come to seem unsatisfactory in, uh, for various reasons recently. Um, and uh, instead, I'm uh, trying to draw on some of the perspectives that have been presented in a variety of recent biographical studies of scientific practitioners, um, in which the uh, self, the persona of the scientific practitioner is shown to be a much more complex and fragmented entity than we tended to assume it was. So these are the general questions that I'm trying to approach through a uh, study of Davy and what I call his experiments in selfhood. Um, so let me start by reminding you a little bit about Humphrey Davy. I expect everyone uh, knows a little bit about him. Uh, he lived from 1778 to 1829. He was famous for the discovery of several chem chemical elements, probably more than any other single individual <laughs> discovered, uh, sodium, potassium, boron, se calcium, several others. Uh, he also invented the miner's safety lamp, um, uh, which was a very famous uh, discovery. He was renowned as a popular scientific lecturer in London at the Royal Institution in the first decade of the 19th century. Um, and he was also a successful writer of a variety of works, uh, scientific papers, um, uh, work on agricultural chemistry, uh, and his final enigmatic final work, which I'll talk about, Constellations in Travel. He was a poet and the friend of uh, very well-known poets, uh, English poets of the time, Coleridge, Southey, and Wordsworth were among his friends. There have been several biographies of Davy, and I'm not really trying to write a comprehensive biography. Um, what I want to get at is, as I say, this subject of Davy's experiments in selfhood. Uh, partly this was a social process. Davy arose through English society. Um, he started uh, from very humble beginnings, uh, was born in a, the town of Penzance, which is in the far southwest of England, right down in the end of uh, Cornwall. Um, and by the end of his life, he had become uh, an aristocrat. He was uh, gained a knighthood and a baronetcy. Um, and this rise up the social ladder um, uh, was one dimension of his self-invention, self-formation. Uh, it uh, gained quite considerable commentary at the time. Um, some uh, contemporaries were very scornful uh, of his achievement, uh, motivated by snobbery or resentment. Uh, a Scottish aristocrat called Davy, a very little man, an absolute quiz, a nobody. Um, uh, so that was one dimension of Davy's self-invention, but there was also a, a profound engagement in examining his own subjectivity. Uh, this was something that he did partly through literary means. Um, as I say, he was a poet and, and in some respects an experimental writer, uh, and partly he did it through actual experimentation, physiological experimentation, on uh, the processes of life itself, using himself as an experimental object. Um, uh, he uh, engaged in uh, studies of respiration, galvanism, and animal electricity, uh, in which he took sometimes considerable risks with his own uh, health and safety, um, submitting himself to danger, uh, dangerous experiments. And these, this willingness to experiment on himself 
was an important part of his public reputation. So he was a man of many parts. Um, he called himself a, a chemist and a philosopher and a poet. Um, uh, he's often been described in his own time and since as a genius. Uh, and that was, uh, you know, a, a, a putative attempt to encompass his whole uh, persona. I don't think it's entirely satisfactory, but I think it is true that Davy modeled himself on contemporary ideas of what a genius was. Um, one thing I think we can be clear about is that Davy was not a professional scientist. He, the word scientist was not used during his lifetime, and a professional was absolutely not what he wanted to be because uh, he considered that demeaning. Uh, he wanted to attain to the status of gentleman uh, and eventually aristocrat, uh, not to a professional. Uh, that, he considered that beneath him. Let me um, try to make more concrete these questions about his I I uh, occupational identity by using this picture. Um, so this is a, a complicated uh, Engraving uh, with the title you see there, Distinguished Men of Science of Great Britain, 1807-8. to eight. Um, uh, And Davy is in the middle of this picture. Um, uh, and I didn't bring my pointer, but he's there. Uh, I can't really see him very clearly. But um, uh, this uh, is a scene that's set in the library of the institution where Davy made his career, the Royal Institution in London. Um, and possibly this presents Davy in the company where he belongs, a uh, man of science of the time. But maybe not. Uh, because this is, as you can see, a retrospective Reconstruction uh, dates from 1862. Uh, the engraving was published by a man called William Walker, a printer uh, in London. Um, and it is uh, unquestionably a retrospective view. Uh, there was no occasion when all of these men assembled together. Uh, what William Walker did was he assembled this portrait from individual portraits of all of the individuals in the picture. Um, that's the, an enlargement of uh, the image of Davy. He's standing behind John Dalton, um, uh, somewhat obscured by Dalton, who's presented much more prominently. Um, and the portrait of Davy is taken from a portrait painted by Sir Thomas Lawrence around 1821. Um, uh, in other words, this is not how Davy looked in 1807 to 8, which is uh, the period when the collective portrait is supposedly set. The collective portrait is a deliberate work of fiction, and it is an argument. Uh, it, it's been uh, suggested by Christine MacLeod that this, uh, the portrait was, the collective portrait was designed to make an argument for the importance of engineers in what was coming to be seen retrospectively as the revolutionary changes in industrial production of the early 19th century. The engraving, Walker's engraving, gives a prominent place to several engineers, implicitly arguing for their inclusion in the category of men of science of the time. Um, Davy is a little bit hard to fit into this uh, picture, and the suggestion is that even the category of men of science was by no means as clearly established in 1807 to 8 as it later came to seem to be in the 1860s when this, when this collective portrait was presented. In other words, I think this problematizes both the question of how Davy related to his own time uh, and uh, uh, the more general narrative of the emergence of the man of science at this time. So, uh, I want us to look for an alternative. I want us to look for an alternative in terms of understanding how Davy made himself the person he became. And what I'm doing in the book is describing a series of personae or characters which Davy assumed 
uh, in approximately chronological order, uh, working through his life. So I'm going to present these, and I'm going to present one of the portraits of Davy to accompany each of these characters, um, uh, because the portraits are interestingly varied. Uh, so my six characters are the enthusiast, the genius, the dandy, the discoverer, the philosopher, and the traveler. So we'll go through those in order. So the first one is the enthusiast. This is a very well-known uh, caricature by James Gilray uh, from 1802. Uh, anyone who read my first book will have seen this. Um, uh, this is actually, it turns out, the only contemporary representation of Davy in the lecture theater of the Royal Institution, where he, where he made his career and became famous. Um, uh, here he is. He is the man holding the bellows uh, uh, next to um, a man who's probably uh, Thomas Garnett, his predecessor as lecturer at the, in chemistry at the Royal Institution. Uh, and they are dispensing gas to uh, a member of the audience with the um, disruptive, uh, chaotic results that you can see there. So what this is is a demonstration of the effects of nitrous oxide, which was later called laughing gas, um, which had been the subject of investigation by Davy uh, in the uh, period before he came to the Royal Institution when he was working in Bristol at the pneumatic institution with a man called Thomas Beddoes uh, in the late 1790s. There, Davy discovered that nitrous oxide had extraordinary properties, that it produced uh, peculiar feelings and bodily movements, that it caused a mood of euphoria, accompanied sometimes by spontaneous laughter and uncontrolled muscular motions. Beddoes and Davy explored the effects of the gas by breathing it themselves and by inviting various friends and family members to breathe it also. Uh, and a distinguished series of uh, individuals, including Robert Southey, Samuel Taylor Coleridge, Gregory Watt, and Thomas Wedgwood, all came to Bristol to partake in the breathing of the gas. They described what they experienced and their narratives were published in a, a book by Beddoes and in a book by Davy, um, the researches chemical and philosophical of 1800. These experiments, which are, uh, there's a, a considerable literature about these experiments. My interest in them is the way in which they demanded a new kind of experimental persona from Davy. The experiments were highly problematic because they required a departure from the traditional protocols of experimentation and reporting. These protocols, which were classically described by Stephen Chapin and Simon Schaffer in their, their work, Leviathan and the Air Pump, um, these protocols had been established in the mid-17th century, uh, and they required the description of the events of the experiment by a neutral observer uh, who was meant to stand back from the process of experiments so that he, it normally was a he, could give uh, an unemotional, factual description of what was happening. Uh, the ideal was a kind of modest witness, as it's been called, uh, somebody who kept him or herself out of the picture as much as possible in order to describe what was happening. This was clearly impossible in a situation in which people were experimenting on themselves. Um, and therefore, the uh, uh, intellectual autonomy which was required of the experimenter was put at risk. Davy attempted to deal with these problems by uh, various measures, um, uh, and he collected the reports of many individuals to try and form a, a, a common account of the experience of breathing nitrous oxide. The problem was, as he said, that the sensations that the gas caused were similar to no others, and they have consequently been indescribable. <laughs> uh, nobody had a vocabulary even to talk about what happened to them when they breathed the gas. Um, uh, one of uh, Beddoes' um, uh, subjects, when asked how he felt on breathing the gas, said, I do not know how, 
but very queer. Uh, another commented enigmatically, I felt like the sound of a harp. So, <laughs> so they were trying to find a vocabulary even to describe what happened to them. And they used uh, physiological and aesthetic terminology. Uh, they talked about sensations, muscular contractions, exc excitation and exhaustion. Uh, and they also in evoked the aesthetic experience of the sublime. They used the word sublime frequently in connection with these experiments. The, the, the pleasure was sublime and intense. In this way, they connected breathing the gas with aesthetic experiences of uh, viewing scenes of nature um, or even great works of art. But this also had its problems because to talk about the sublime was to evoke a whole discourse um, uh, in the 18th century about aesthetics, uh, the most prominent contributor to, to which was Edmund Burke, um, uh, who'd written a classic work in the 1750s on the sublime, um, in which he had explained that the experience of the sublime was an experience of the passions, um, one which uh, uh, mobilized influenced the nerves and the muscle fibers. Uh, Burke understood it quite physiologically. Um, and at the same time, according to Burke, the experience of the sublime uh, challenged the autonomy, the mental autonomy of the intellectual processes of the person undergoing the experience. So to describe breathing nitrous oxide as sublime suggested, again, that the uh, intellectual uh, capacity of the subject was uh, damaged or qualified, um, uh, impinged upon by the physiological experience. Davy understood that these experiments with nitrous oxide raised fundamental issues concerning personal identity. Um, there was one occasion when he had uh, uh, binged, as it were, on nitrous oxide and alcohol. He'd drunk a whole bottle of wine and then you know, gone and breathed as much nitrous oxide as he could. And at the end of this experience, he, he um, recorded that he lost all connection with external things. Uh, and he, spoke, he recorded that he cried out to a bystander, nothing exists but thoughts. The universe is composed of impressions, ideas, pleasures, and pains. So he was a kind of... Um, uh, in a way evoking the idealist philosophy of uh, the Irish philosopher George Berkeley uh, earlier in the 18th century. Um, and at the same time, he was reflecting on this experience in a letter he wrote to a friend uh, in March 1800. Um, uh, he said, I, I've been puzzling myself to find out what people mean by external things. When we say that an external world exists we mean nothing more than that ideas exist, capable of modifying impressions. As for our identities, for example, self, our friends, all the people we know intimately, all the places we are well acquainted with, etc., they are connected with the possibility of our perceiving impressions. So he's thinking about the question of personal identity and how it relates to sensory experience in a way that many other empiricist thinkers of the 18th century had done. And he's arguing that the sense of self itself is disrupted by uh, changes in experience. So the uh, breathing nitrous oxide, which uh, messes with the senses and, and also with the memory, in fact, so it was often impossible for people to remember what had happened to them when they were breathing the gas. Uh, this experience, uh, Davy understood, uh, was disruptive to the sense of self, to the identity. Um, this is another uh, nice image of um, breathing nitrous oxide from Philadelphia uh, from 1810 when the, the American chemist called William Barton uh, uh, took it over and... Uh, initiated his students <laughs> into the pleasure of breathing nitrous oxide. Um, so these experiments were uh, unsettling uh, for everybody involved, um, uh, very hard to articulate, very hard to reproduce, in fact, um, and very unclear in their implications for personal identity and the relations between the mind and the body. 
There was also uh, a further complicating factor, which was the political situation at the time. Uh, Beddoes was identified with the cause of uh, reform uh, in England at the end of the 1790s and the, uh, after the French Revolution in the context of the wars between uh, England and, Napoleon, uh, and France, uh, Napoleon soon to come to power. Um, uh, there was considerable political tension surrounding many of these issues and considerable anxiety about what was called enthusiasm at the time, which was thought to be a dangerous um, uh, 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 release of the passions um, in an uncontrolled manner, uh, which was thought to lead potentially to political upheaval and um, uh, revolution. And yet, so um, uh, Beddoes and Davy were in fact satirized as enthusiasts um, uh, for their involvement in the nitrous oxide episode. And yet, Davy understood that that term was appropriate to describe himself. Um, uh, he's, he wrote in his notes, I am a little of an enthusiast. Uh, he um, uh, uh, specifically used the term to describe himself. At the same time, reflecting on what enthusiasm was, uh, in uh, one of his notebooks he wrote an essay about um, enthusiasm as it manifested itself uh, in political and social movements, uh, talking about the Quakers, uh, and also a man called Richard Brothers, who was a self-proclaimed prophet of the apocalypse who emerged in England in the middle of the 1790s and was confined in a lunatic asylum by the government authorities. Uh, so this was exactly how charged, as it were, the word enthusiasm was at the time. Um, and yet Davy embraced it, uh, accepted it uh, for himself. Um, and he also continued to use and deploy nitrous oxide um, uh, Gilray's cartoon, um, uh, I think, I used to think that Gilray's cartoon had sort of killed off interest in nitrous oxide, at least in Davy's circle. But this turns out not to be true. He was still, in fact, showing it in his lectures at the Royal Institution. Uh, uh, we know in 1809 and 1810, um, but he wasn't sharing it with his audience, uh, as some other lecturers in London at the time would do. What Davy would do, and we know it, this from a description by a Scottish uh, natural philosopher called James Dinwiddie, who attended the, Davy's lectures, what Davy would do is he would demonstrate the effects of nitrous oxide on himself in front of the audience. In other words, reminding them uh, that this was a part of his persona as an experimenter, that he was um, particularly uh, susceptible to this um, uh, gas and uh, in that respect continuing to embrace the character of an enthusiast. Now this then modulates into Davy's second character, the genius. Um, uh, Davy, as I say, continued to use nitrous oxide and he continued to uh, exploit and develop the ex character which he had uh, originally assumed of a, an enthusiast. Um, he continued to display himself as a man of passion and sensibility with a deep feeling uh, and a singular susceptibility to the powers of nature. Um, he, uh, in his lectures at the Royal Institution, displayed himself um, in an embodied manner uh, using his body not only to display, but also uh, to, for example, assess the strength of voltaic batteries uh, and to um, uh, uh, discharge uh, electricity through himself um, and to uh, test the effects of chemicals uh, upon himself. Um, uh, he uh, developed the reputation of being a very risky self-experimenter, um, which was an important part of the persona he, he displayed in his lectures. The historian Harriet Martineau said that of all the men of science of his day, Davy, quote, presented most strongly to the popular observation the attributes of genius. 
And that's the key thing, I think, presented most strongly to the popular observation, the attributes of genius. Genius was a kind of performance for Davy. Um, it was a performance that he enacted in the theater of the Royal Institution, where he established himself at the apex of the London lecturing scene. Uh, he became a favorite of the social elite uh, with an audience that included a, uh, an unusually large proportion of women in his audience. Um, uh, and he uh, became the most prominent of a, a quite crowded field of lecturers, scientific lecturers in London uh, in the first decade of the 19th century. Um, this uh, reputation he acquired by feeding the uh, appetite of his audience for spectacular experimental displays. Uh, one commentator said that um, his exhibitions in the lecture room were always contrived to interest and affect the multitude uh, of the higher classes. He would uh, use a voltaic battery to produce shocks and sparks and loud noises. Uh, he would throw lumps of sodium and potassium into water or onto blocks of ice, and you all remember from school what happens when, when you do that. Um, uh, he made a model volcano which would dis throw out lava. Uh, well, it wasn't really lava, but the, the, you know, it would throw out sparks and things. Uh, 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 and tumultuous applause was said to have greeted that effect when, when he shown it. Um, and this self-presentation was consistent with the way Davy himself understood the idea of genius. Um, as I say, he understood it in a performative manner. In his discourse introductory to a course of lectures on chemistry, which he published in 1802, he wrote, the man of true genius will make use of all the instruments of investigation. Um, uh, the modern chemist, he told his audience, could take advantage of startling new forces, especially voltaic electricity, and the power of galvanism to reanimate dead matter. These powers, he told his audience, could be, according to circumstances, instruments of comfort and enjoyment, or of terror and destruction. The combination of pleasure and terror was, the, of course, the familiar aesthetic experience of the sublime. So Davy was conveying this experience to his audience through uh, his enactment of his own genius. But there was another side to it, which is the third character, the dandy. Uh, this is a portrait which you've already seen by Sir Thomas Lawrence from 1821. Um, Davy's self-exhibition in the lecture theatre of the Royal Institution drew intense scrutiny from his contemporaries. Commentators discussed his physiognomy, his passions, his manners, his clothing, and his health. Uh, and the commentary pen penetrated beyond the superficial attributes to probe more intimate aspects of his identity, especially in relation to social class and gender. Davy was vulnerable to this sort of scrutiny because of the cultivation of manners and demeanor he had undertaken in the course of his social ascent. Uh, when he arrived in the metropolis, he entered what was often described as a morally destabilizing place, liable to the distractions of fashion and the temptations of corruption. Davy accepted aristocratic patronage on his path to celebrity. And some uh, provincial uh, progressives, such as the Scottish Whig Henry Broom, discussed whether what Broom called Davy's manly independence had been compromised by his submission to the aristocratic influence and the corrupt ambience of fashionable philosophy. Broom, in fact, made a comparison uh, between Davy's situation in London among the social elite, and his breathing nitrous oxide. Uh, he said it's similar, uh, 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 that ambience in London had a similar effect, Broom said, uh, a similarly intoxicating effect on the party tasting it and a ludicrous one on all beholders. Um, uh, on the other hand, there were plenty of uh, upper-class people in London who despised Davy and saw him as a, an upstart, an <coughs> arriviste. Uh, in uh, 1820, the John Bull magazine wrote of Davy, 
quote, the clothes of a gentleman do not sit easily upon him. He smells of the shop completely. Okay. Now, uh, the persistent theme of this criticism was the suggestion that Davies' masculinity was compromised. In part, this was because of the fierce arguments at the time about women's education and about whether women should uh, have a role in public life in general and, and in the sciences in particular. Um, Davy had made a particular attempt to appeal to women among his audience uh, in the language that he'd used, in the vivid uh, uh, experimental demonstrations that he performed. Uh, James Dinwiddie recorded that Davy flirted with the uh, women in his audience and uh, complimented them on their politeness and sensibility. Um, uh, and other commentators noted that women were particularly attentive in the audience uh, for his lectures. This generated criticism of Davy as a fop or dandy. And a dandy was somebody who was identified with um, self preening, preening self display before an audience. Uh, so, this John Bull magazine, which criticized Davy in 1820, described his dandyish clothing and his puppyism in female company. Quote, the poor fellow fancies himself irresistible among the girls and is evidently pluming himself while conversing with them. Okay. Now, this portrait is, in some respects, this is the best representation of Davy as a dandy because the clothes he's wearing here are, in fact, specifically the, um, the accoutrements of a dandy. Uh, the, uh, the waistcoat, the uh, kid gloves, kid leather gloves, the starched cravat at the neck, uh, and so on. Uh, there, was, there was an issue about Davy's actual uh, being a dandy because he was, of course, engaged in a somewhat menial occupation, at least until he retired in 1812 from lecturing. Um, but... Nonetheless, in satirical terms, this was the character that was pinned upon him. And I think it has to do specifically with his uh, appeal to female uh, uh, members of his audience. Um, uh, that was controversial, and I think it was what resulted in this identification of him as a dandy. The, second, the next portrait presents a completely different image of Davy. It's almost impossible to believe these are the same person. Um, this is an earlier portrait of Davy in uh, uh, the laboratory of the Royal Institution. Or, well, he isn't in the laboratory, but he's shown with apparatus from the laboratory. Um, and this dates from 1812, and it's, it's still in the custody of the Royal Institution. Um, so this is uh, my uh, fourth character, is the discoverer. Is the, uh, and what I am trying to get at here is the way in which Davy used his success with an audience in the lecture theatre of the Royal Institution to support his work in the laboratory. Um, uh, and in the laboratory, he also invited spectators to come and see. The laboratory in the basement of the Royal Institution also included an area over here where there is seating. People can come and see the, the uh, uh, experiments actually being conducted, the research actually being conducted. Um, and Davy was said to have welcomed visitors to uh, whenever he was working in the laboratory. People could come and see him doing it. Um, according to his brother, John Davy, who wrote one of the uh, most important biographies of Davy, um, he uh, manifested the same uh, zeal, zeal is the word John Davy uses, uh, in the laboratory as he did in the lecture theatre. Uh, he was uh, uh, kind of surrendered to a frenzy of enthusiasm uh, while he was working, just as he did upstairs uh, when he was lecturing. Um, so there's a very important connection between the, the presentation in the lecture theatre and the presentation in the laboratory. Uh, in fact, there was a motion backwards and forwards between the activity of research and the activity of uh, performance. This was uh, very important for the way Davy used his most important instrument, which was the electrical battery, the voltaic battery. Um, uh, 
the, this was the instrument with which his status as a discoverer was most closely associated. Uh, one observer of his lectures wrote that he appeared in the theatre, quote, as the mighty magician of nature begirt by his immense voltaic battery. Um, uh, he had constructed the first uh, of these apparatuses in uh, 1803 with the um, you know, contributions from the audience uh, at the Royal Institution and then in 1808 he constructed the larger version which you see here um, which has 2,000 uh, uh, sets of plates uh, altogether uh, arranged in series so that the, the uh, uh, electrical power is compounded. Um, and this was what he used in a series of battles with the French chemists uh, uh, Gay-Lussac and Thénard uh, whose apparatus, who had their own apparatus in Paris, which had been built with the support of Napoleon. Um, uh, so uh, as, uh, as the British were fighting the French on the battlefield, Davy was fighting the French chemists with their, their uh, voltaic batteries. Um, uh, and there was a whole, a whole series of controversies uh, that unfolded um, as uh, Davy was uh, asserting his discoveries of several new elements. He also, uh, in 1810, uh, he, um, in a sense, didn't, didn't discover an element, but he asserted that it was an element. There was a substance that had been called oxymuriatic acid um, uh, by the uh, French chemists, uh, and Davy asserted that this was an element, uh, and he called it chlorine. Um, and uh, in this case, he didn't have anything to display <laughs> other than just his uh, persona as a discoverer and his reputation of what he had discovered with the voltaic battery. Um, and there was also a prolonged controversy that followed that, that uh, announcement. It took years, really, for Davy to win over the chemical community as a whole to the uh, claim that chlorine was an element. Um, so... Uh, this um, uh, Davy's self-investment in this instrument, which was integral to his persona as a discoverer, was to some degree localized. Uh, it was highly personal and embodied, and, and to some degree localized. Uh, and it wasn't always easy to extend it uh, into other domains. Davy made one attempt to write a textbook of chemistry. Uh, it was called The Elements of Chemical Philosophy, but only part one of volume one ever appeared, and he abandoned the project at that point, because he, the idea of the book was that every experiment in it would have been verified by the author. Uh, and so his, his personal authority was very closely uh, wrapped up with the authorship of this book. Um, and this turned out to be just an impossible task to accomplish. So all he was able to do was complete the, very, the first part of the book, which deals with the chemical elements, because, of course, he had discovered several of the chemical elements, and so he could talk about them and talk about the instrument with which he discovered them. Um, but he wasn't able to go any further. He abandoned the project. Um, and it was also quite uh, uh, subject to quite serious criticism at the time. Um, he was thought to have uh, uh, produced something which was much, much too personal to be a textbook. Uh, of chemistry. So by uh, around uh, 18, uh, well, by 1812, Davy's um, uh, career was uh, approaching a, an important turning point. Uh, in 1812, he uh, resigned from paid employment at the Royal Institution and he married a wealthy widow, Jane at Brees, and was awarded a knighthood. And from that point on, he uh, assumed a quite different character. Uh, and this is the character I call the philosopher, um, because he continued to be involved in projects for uh, applied science. Um, uh, two in particular, the invention of the miner's safety lamp and a scheme to protect the uh, hulls of ships, the copper hulls of ships, from corrosion. I think it's important in uh, connection with both these projects that Davy asserted his status as a philosopher. Uh, and this meant two things. Firstly, the claim uh, in, light, in, in line with much enlightenment thinking was that the intellectual um, uh, capabilities of the philosopher 
produce practical results. Uh, the mind over matter. Uh, the, inter- the philosopher can direct the practical arts. Uh, that was part of it. But it was also to, uh, to call himself a philosopher was to align himself with a, a long tradition going back to the ancient world of the philosopher and the philosopher's persona one feature of which was that uh, the philosopher is meant to be independent of motivations of personal gain um, and uh, money and economics. Um, and uh, this was also important for Davy. So both these things emerged in the story of the safety lamp, which I briefly summarized. The, the safety lamp was uh, invented uh, in 1815. Uh, Davy was asked by some mine owners in the northeast of England to design a lamp which would function uh, in uh, conditions of combustible gases uh, down in mines. Um, And he made a a design uh, in which the flame of the lamp was surrounded by a gauze or mesh which prevented uh, ignition of the gases occurring. But no sooner had he made this design public than uh, there were allegations that he had not acknowledged his debt to other people who had made other designs of of miners' lamp. In particular, George Stevenson, who's very famous in England as an inventor of a steam locomotive, uh, this time was an engineer in a a coal mine near Newcastle-on-Tyne, who had his own design of the safety lamp and had been demonstrating it when Davy was touring around mines in that, in that part of the country. Um, Davy insisted that he alone had been guided by purely scientific knowledge and a philosophical view of the question, and he denounced Stevenson as a, quote, mechanic, uh, condescendingly referring to his, quote, experiments, if his can be so called, Uh, and insisting on his own standing as a philosopher. Um, As I say, the other component of the uh, identity of the philosopher is an insistence uh, that one is completely detached from motives of personal gain. And Davy did insist on that. He declined to patent the lamp. Uh, uh, He declared that he was giving it uh, as a, a generous act to humanity as a whole. Um, and it's on that, on that level that it appears, the safety lamp appears as an attribute of Davy in this portrait uh, by Thomas Phillips, uh, written, uh, painted um, uh, uh, at the uh, uh, request of uh, uh, one of the mine owners who had, who had um, employed Davy for this purpose, um, and also in the picture I showed earlier by Sir Thomas Lawrence, the safety lamp is also there. So this is a, it becomes an attribute of Davy as a philosopher. Um, I think I'll, I'll skip uh, the bit about the, um, uh, the scheme to protect ship's hulls from corrosion. It's an interesting story, but uh, it was also it was a, a failure, dramatic failure. Uh, but again, Davy insisted on his own identity as a philosopher in relation to this. He insisted that it was perfectly uh, rational, uh, what he'd proposed to do to, to protect the hulls of ships from corrosion, and it had only not worked because of other people down the line who hadn't done what they were meant to do to, to put it into practice. And he also insisted that he had given his uh, uh, invention generously to, to uh, the country, uh, the people as a whole, and not taken advantage of the uh, uh, material benefits that he could have gained from it. So, I move to my final persona. This is the traveller. Um, this is um, particularly... Davy was a lifelong traveller, but it particularly emerged uh, after he resigned as president of the Royal Society in 1827. He'd become president in 1820, and his p- tenure as, uh, of the presidency of the Royal Society was not, in general, a happy one, and it was ended by serious illness. Um, He had a stroke uh, in 1826, uh, was forced to resign in 1827, and then uh, uh, undertook lengthy travels on the European continent uh, where he experienced another stroke in Rome uh, in the uh, early 1829 and died in Geneva on his way back to England, never got back, died in Geneva and is buried there. 
um, died in May 1829. Um, his last book is this uh, enigmatic work, Consolations in Travel, uh, or, or with the subtitle, The Last Days of a Philosopher. Um, uh, this was dictated to an amanuensis uh, during Davy's final illness and travels, and it's a very peculiar work, uh, including uh, episodes of apparent autobiography, narratives of dreams, uh, philosophical dialogues about religion and immortality, visions of spectral beings and travel to other planets, uh, disquisitions on chemistry and geology and so on. Um, it, it draws inspiration from a whole raft of Enlightenment literature by Voltaire, Condorcet, Volney, and so on and so forth. Um, but it's really Davy's own synthesis uh, and, and uh, uh, construction. And it was, it's been puzzling readers ever since it <laughs> came out. Um, uh, many of the early reviewers uh, wondered uh, what, this, what this book was meant to be about uh, and why it was, had such a, a strange heterogeneous contents and apparently no real design to it. Um, and readers were also puzzled by the fact that Davy himself appears to a, a, a appear in more than one form in this dialogue. Uh, there's a character who's the narrator, who's called Philolethes, who mentions um, some, having experienced some of the things that Davy had actually experienced in his life. But then there's also another character called the Unknown, uh, who is encountered in the uh, Temple of Pestum in southern Italy, near Naples. Uh, and he's a rather enigmatic figure who's said to be of handsome countenance in classical or clerical garb, um, and he also seems to speak for Davy, and he voices some of Davy's opinions. And several reviewers wondered why, why he'd done this. Why, why are there two characters who represent him in one book? Well, I think it's not altogether surprising, given what I've said about the multiple characters and personae that Davy assumed in the course of his life. Um, uh, in some ways, these things, this uh, process of experimenting with his selfhood comes to culmination in Consolations in Travel. Um, uh, he, Davy was looking for a way to uh, embody his authority in a persona, uh, a character, which I think he wanted not to be too closely identifiable with himself. Uh, the unknown... Uh, it, when he enters the um, uh, text, moves the discussion onto, as it were, a more transcendental plane, and he talks about uh, immortality, uh, life after death, and so on. Um, and I think Davy wanted these, this um, uh, discourse to be carried by a character who was unworldly, even otherworldly. Um, uh, so we get this uh, person persona of the unknown, uh, apparently ageless, rootless, uh, aloof from the normal run of humanity. Davy knew that he was approaching the end of his life, and he had an obvious interest in questions of immortality and life after death. Um, he wrote uh, to his wife as he finished this book that he was, quote, looking into futurity with the prophetic aspirations belonging to the last moments of existence. Okay. Um, and the uh, argument of the book does suggest, as I say, that uh, life continues after death. It's a, a denunciation of materialism, uh, which Davy had earlier been attracted to in his youth, um, uh, in favor of a, a, an idealism. Uh, and in other words, it, it, it deals with the same kind of issues of personal identity and the continuity of personal identity, which Davy had originally raised in connection with the experience of nitrous oxide. Now he's thinking about the possible continuity of identity after death uh, and the survival of spiritual life beyond the, the end of uh, bodily life. Um, so this is the final... Oh, this is, sorry, this is where they meet the, uh, the unknown in the Temple of Pestum. Uh, the fifth edition of the book had uh, these lovely illustrations, which were not in the, the first few editions of the book. Um, and then finally, the final, the final uh, dialogue of the Consolations is uh, 
set in the harbour at uh, uh, what's called Pola, now called Pula in Croatia. Um, so this book was um, uh, uh, actually uh, quite popular. Um, Charles Lyle and Charles Darwin both read it uh, and wrote about it. Um, uh, Davy, what he does in uh, portions of this book is describe very, very long-term processes of change, geological change in the landscape. Uh, in a way, the consolations, the consolations that are to be derived from travel in this book relate to uh, a sense of the long durée or whatever, the long history of, of, of uh, the landscape of the earth and the long unfolding of the processes of geological change. But it also, of course, relates to um, the ancient philosophical traditions, which I mentioned. The title is an obvious echo of Boethius's Consolations of Philosophy. And Davy was knowingly invoking Platonic and early Christian notions uh, of the continuity of selfhood after death. And he was rejecting the, the materialistic alternatives which in ancient times are associated with Lucretius and Epicurus. Um, but I've been arguing that this concern with selfhood was a consistent one throughout Davy's, Davy's life. Uh, the nitrous oxide investigation required him to abandon the stance of an invisible observer and insert himself into the experimental scene as a subject. Uh, in his account of the episode, he emerged as peculiarly susceptible to the sublime powers of nature, as something of an enthusiast, in fact. In the theatre of the Royal Institution, he displayed a slightly different character, gaining the attention of an elite London audience who made him the object of their fascinated gaze. Davy's glamorous appearance and impassioned eloquence were seen by his admirers as attributes of his genius. And the Voltaic Battery was associated with this charismatic individual. His manipulation of the instrument in a setting of public display was the key to Davy's discoveries of the chemical elements, uh, though he failed to translate his standing as a discoverer into um, successful authorship of a textbook of chemistry. When Samuel Taylor Coleridge was studying chemistry in 1800 under the, under the influence of Davy, and uh, for whom he was, uh, had a, a very, very deep affection. He expressed the worry that his own fascination for the subject was <coughs> but Davyism. Um, and I'm uh, arguing, I'm trying to argue that an interest in this particular individual can be more than just Davyism. Uh, I don't suggest that Davy was not unique. He was unique, and there's no evading his uniqueness. I don't think he was typical in any way. But I think that a study of this particular individual can yield more general reflections or conclusions, precisely because of the intensity of his own deliberation on his selfhood, um, the intensity of his uh, experimentation uh, in selfhood. Um, I think this brings into focus aspects of the emergence of the man of science in this period that have been overlooked by those who focus solely on the formation of institutions and the creation of professional careers. Davy shows that more creative projects of self-cultivation were also involved, some of them drawing on uh, contemporary currents of romanticism, others descending from much deeper roots in the philosophical tradition. If we bring these elements into the picture, um, we can complicate the narratives of institutionalization and professionalization. Uh, we can highlight aspects of the scientific self that might otherwise be ignored, but which appear in the profiles of other men of science if, if we look hard enough. I mean, Davy's uh, own sort of arduous self-experimentation uh, can also be found uh, to some degree in subsequent men of science in the 19th century um, uh, who, uh, it's been said, suffered for science and who submitted themselves to, to uh, dangerous and uh, arduous uh, uh, processes uh, uh, and uh, effects on their bodies as well. His um, investment in a particular instrument, I think, uh, uh, illuminates what John Tresh has recently called the romantic machine, uh, the concept of, of this particular era of uh, romanticism and mechanization in which, in which machines were invested with the properties of vitality in certain respects. Um, 
I mentioned the ways in which Davy's model of a scientific traveler was important for Lyle and Darwin and others who read his, his book on travel and, and learned from it. Um, I think there are other, uh, also to understand a life as a series of personae or characters, I think also has its benefits. Um, we can think of other people, other scientific practitioners who moved between disciplines in the course of their careers. Uh, or who developed a public role in addition to their uh, private um, or uh, specialist uh, occupation. We can think of other individuals touched by scandal or gossip, uh, which uh, impinged on um, uh, their reputation as well. And we can also think of other individuals who sought comfort in religion as they confronted their own demise. So this sort of uh, longitudinal study of an individual's uh, lives um, I think can perhaps benefit from uh, this uh, model of uh, exploring a series of personae or characters that an individual goes through. So my claim is that there's more than mere Davyism in this story. Thank you.